Hi, today Australia's just come out of its um, COVID-19 lockdown. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, nothing to do with COVID-19, but the history of hepatitis C. Um, until now, not a lot of people, apart from people with hepatitis C, have been much interested in viruses. But in the last uh, six months, the, the idea of viruses being like a major threat to humanity uh, has become very real for everyone, not just people with hepatitis C. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the history of hepatitis C. So first of all, um, when we say hepatitis, we've got hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis D, hepatitis E, and so on. Now, they're all not related, so there's, there's no rel relationship between hepatitis C and hepatitis B hepatitis A, they're, they're totally different animals. Uh, they're just called hepatitis because they affect the liver. Um, so anything, any virus that attacks the liver is a hepatitis, but they're, they're totally different animals. They're, they're treated differently, their effects are differently, they're transmitted differently. So hepatitis C was only actually discovered in um, 1989. Before then, scientists and doctors knew that there was a uh, another kind of hepatitis but they hadn't been able to isolate it or identify it they just called it hepatitis not a and hepatitis not b so in 1989 hepatitis c was discovered uh, and before that if people died of hepatitis c they just died of liver cancer or they just died of liver failure or something like that they, no, there's no record of people dying of hepatitis C before basically 1990. So um, heaps of people used to die of liver cirrhosis uh, and uh, liver cancer for unknown causes. For example, my wife's grandmother, who was a teetotaler, a Methodist, didn't drink any alcohol, alcohol at all, uh, died of liver cirrhosis. Um, there was no, no understanding of why she got liver cirrhosis, but almost certainly she had hepatitis C. Uh, now, the reality is that today, in the world today, probably about 1% of every population on Earth, so 1% of all of humanity, actually has hepatitis C. So there's about 100 million people with hepatitis C today as I speak. Um, sure, there's a few getting cured now, but it's only a drop in the ocean compared to the amount of people who still have hepatitis C. Now back in the day, back in the 1950s or 1850s or whatever, probably there was a lot more people with hepatitis C because there wasn't the hygiene. It's quite likely that in the 1850s or the 1750s could have been a third or even uh, what a, lo a lot of people would have had hepatitis C and just died in their, in their 40s or 50s from liver failure without anyone knowing why they just they would just die they get sick and get jaundice jaundice was a common thing people would describe oh uncle such and such got jaundice in other words his skin and eyes turned yellow and then he died six months later or a year later so the reason why in the past many many more people would have had hepatitis c is purely hygiene so if you went to the dentist in the 19th century there was no hygiene, you know, there was blood everywhere, the dentist didn't wear gloves, probably didn't even wash his hands after, he, after he'd um, drilled someone else's tooth out. Um, so there was blood to blood transmission. Even today, uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, a lot of people got hep C from dental work. Imagine how it was at the end of the 19th century when there was a lot of dentistry going on, but no hygiene. So if you went to the dentist, you had a pretty good chance of getting hep C and dying 20 years later from, from uh, liver cirrhosis. Uh, likewise, even if you went to the barber, I mean, you know, people used to go and get a shave at the barber. Again, no sanitization. Little nick, blood, the razor wasn't cleaned, bang, you've got hep C. Um, any sort of minor surgery, again, there wasn't the cleanliness. So the number of people who had hep C in the 19th, early 20th century was probably, God, might have been 10 times what, what, what we have now. No studies have ever been done on, on that, but if you just look at the, um, the way that hep C is, treated, uh, is transmitted, 
blood to blood. In the past, a lot more people would have caught hep C because of people just didn't worry about washing up. And soldiers, you know, if you were a soldier in the First World War or the Napoleonic Wars or any war, and it was hand-to-hand -hand combat in a lot of those situations, there's blood everywhere. You've got blood on you, you've got other people's blood on you, your blood on you. Uh, people in those situations, if there was hep C around, which there was, are going to get hep C. So I'd ima imagine that soldiers in the past had very high levels of hepatitis C, just purely because they're always getting in contact with blood. Again, field surgeries uh, in the 19th and early 20th century were very basic. There was blood on the knives, blood on the stitches, blood on the needles, blood everywhere. So in the past, so many people would have had hep C. Now, as hygiene practices changed in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, less and less people got hep C. But even in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of hep C transmitted, not through intravenous drug use, which everyone talks about, but through tattoos, getting your ears pierced, um, dentists, barbers, pedicurists, anything where there was a tiny drop of blood being moved around on, on implements or instruments, people would be transmitting hep C. So in a lot of countries in the, in the middle of the 20th century, hep C rates were like you know, three or four percent of the population. Um, so nowadays we we can test for Hep C and we and we know how it's transmitted. So people are much much more careful about uh, anything involving blood. So it's not transmitted as much in Western countries, but in a lot of uh, underdeveloped countries where hygiene isn't uh, so strictly followed, it's like Africa and Asia and and South America. Uh, there's still very high levels of hepatitis C infections. So uh, hep C was discovered, first of all, isolated, identified in 18, sorry, 1989. Um, but not much was known about it until the uh, mid-1990s. And then people started to investigate. It. They realized how many people were infected by it, how much it was costing society in terms of human suffering and, and illness. And uh, a bit of work went into, first of all, finding how it was transmitted and then um, spreading education about how not to transmit hep C through simple procedures. And then, of course, how do we cure hep C? Now, hep A, hep B, you can get a vaccine for um, and, you know, there's, there's no problem. You get a vaccine, you don't catch it. Hep C, there is no vaccine. There was a lot of trying for many years and years to develop a, va a vaccine for hep C, but it just never happened. Uh, so they tried, first of all, HIV drugs uh, against hep C, because already HIV was a big issue in the world. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of success until they started to use the combination of interferon and ribavirin. Now, both of those uh, drugs are very toxic uh, and whilst they did cure about 40 or 50 percent of cases of hep C, they also did a lot of damage to a lot of people. So people would end up being cured from hep C, but actually um, they got so much damage from the interferon and ribavirin that they were sick of them when they had hep C. So interferon was a treatment that a lot of people didn't get purely because they heard how bad it was and they just didn't want to go through it. So. All through the 90s, uh, you had the option of being treated uh, with interferon and ribavirin uh, or just putting up with your hep C and trying to manage it through lifestyle. Then, of course, uh, in the um, first decade of the 21st century, the 20 noughties, uh, the uh, work with uh, direct acting antivirals came up. So you had Sophosphavir was the big breakthrough, and um, that patent for Sophosphavir, which was the first, um, or that was the first of a family of drugs that actually could kill hepatitis C without almost killing the patient in the process, uh, that eventually became available to everyone uh, in, or well, not available to everyone. It became available at an extremely high price uh, in. Uh, 2011, 12, it was available and widely available in 2014, but at a huge price. You know, you were looking at basically $100,000 for, 
to get a treatment if you had hep C. So if you didn't have insurance uh, or you didn't live in a country where they provided free medication, uh, you were stuck with your hep C anyway. Uh, so hepatitis C first start, starts getting cured effectively without uh, any dramatic side effects with the arrival of sulfosfavir, which is the brand name Sylvardi. But then everything changed in the 2015 when India didn't recognise the patent for sulfosfavir and started to manufacture uh, generic versions of sulfosfavir and very shortly uh, was providing uh, a hepatitis C treatment for around a hundredth for the cost that it was available for everywhere else in the world. So that's um, you know around a thousand US. Since then, uh, a, a lot of different countries have decided not to recognise the patent for Savaldi and Pavoni and Epclusa and so on. And so around the world now, in places like Egypt, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, I think Algeria's, they're manufacturing uh, generic versions of Savaldi, of Havoni, of Epclusa, and selling them for sort of between the $500 and $1,000 US mark for a full treatment. So nowadays, people with hep C can get treatment at a reasonable price if they live in a reasonably affluent country. Because, you know, like here in Australia or in the USA or Canada or France or the UK, $500, $600 is not a real problem to find. But if you live in a place like uh, Nigeria or um, the Philippines or whatever, where the, the average wage is about 8 or $10 a week, then finding you know, five or $600 is a real big problem. So whilst a lot of people are getting cured of hep C now, the reality is that we still have the same number of people globally infected with hepatitis C as we had 20 years ago. There's about somewhere between 80 and 100 million people infected with hepatitis C today, and there was 20 years ago. The reason for this is firstly, uh, the treatment just isn't affordable to uh, a vast proportion of the world's population, like uh, probably 60% of the world's population just cannot raise 500 bucks to get hepatitis C treatment. And the other reason is that um, in those same countries where uh, the cost of hepatitis C treatment is very high, uh, education about hygiene and hepatitis C transmission is very low. So people are still getting infected through um, dental procedures, uh, tattoos, intravenous drug use, um, minor medical procedures, all that kind of stuff, blood transfusions even. So uh, whilst for some of us, uh, the, the lucky ones who live in the lucky countries, uh, we can now treat hepatitis C still for a very large proportion of the world's population, hepatitis C is still basically a death sentence. But the reality is that 1% of all people with hepatitis C will die every year. So some people may have had hepatitis C for 20 years. They've got the same chance of dying as someone who's had it for 10 years. Every, every 100 people, one person will die every year who's got hep C. So it's somewhere, somewhere around about um, 800,000 to a million people will die every year from hepatitis C, which is an easily treatable, easily curable disease, uh, but is still, treatment is out of reach for you know, more than half of the world's population. So that's a brief history of hepatitis C. Uh, it's a nasty beast that's still with us. And I hope that um, in a few years time, uh, the world will get compassionate enough and uh, savvy enough to uh, make hepatitis C treatment available to everyone in the world at an affordable price. Uh, so that's me for the, for the talk for today. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye.